Let's talk about nil potency, which is closely related to solvability that we looked at last time. So in order to define nil potency, we'll recap with the definition of solvability. So solvable is related to the derived series of a Lie algebra. And recall that the derived series was simply the uh, sequence of repeated derived algebra. So we had L to the zero is L, and then L to the I is the derived algebra of the previous term in the series. And so we said that, these, that L was solvable if there exists N such that L to the N equals zero. So no potency is almost identically defined with a slightly different series. So a Lie algebra is said to be no potent if its lower central series terminates. And the lower central series is defined in terms of, um, instead of derived algebras, we're just gonna bracket with L itself. So the first term, once again, is L, the zero equals L, and then um, L to the I is equal to L bracket L to the I minus one. So we say that the Lie algebra is no potent if there exists N such that L to the N equals zero. So they're, they're pretty closely related. And in fact, no potency implies solvability. And the way to see that is by considering um, L to the I and L to the parentheses I. What we see is that L to the parentheses I, every time we take a term in the derived series, we bracket with potentially fewer vectors than we would when we take terms in the lower central series. Because in the lower central series, we bracket with L each time rather than um, an ideal of L, which are these L to the parentheses I. So what ends up happening is that L to the I is a superset of L to the parentheses I. Um, and it can be shown pretty easily, but I won't take the uh, few minutes it might take to show that. But uh, what this implies is that if you're no potent, then zero equals L to the N, oops, L to the N for some N, and this contains L to the parentheses N, so clearly this guy has to be solvable. And so, or rather, this has to be zero. And so what that means is that the uh, low, if the lower central series terminates, the derived series terminates, and we have that no potent implies solvable. So no potent C is a stronger condition, and the strongest condition, I hope this is clear, is that is abelian, right? Because the abelians, both its derived series and um, the lower central series of an abelian Lie algebra terminate at the second term. L bracket L has to be zero because everything commutes with everything. So with that being said, let's take a look at a nice example. And that nice example is an example we've seen, which are the wonderful upper triangular matrices. So upper triangular matrices, we'll take a look at in particular uh, when we have four dimensional matrices with um, with over the complex number. So we have E11, E12, E13, E14, E22, E23, E24, E33, E34, and finally E44 as the basis vectors of this algebra. And what we notice is if we follow our definition of taking, if we call this L, and then we take L, and then L bracket L, which is the second term, and then L bracket, L bracket L, and so on. Observe that in, in the first term here, E11 and E12 are both elements of L. So if you bracket E11 with E12, that is an element of L bracket L. But this guy is actually equal to E12. So this guy is an E12 is an element of L bracket L. But if E12 is a bracket of L bracket L, so E12 is an element of this guy, then by the same logic, if I just bracket with E11 again, that means E12 is, a bracket, is an element of uh, L2 over here. And so what we see is that E12 is an element of L to the I for all I. So clearly the lower central series can't terminate, 
and we see that this guy is not no potent, is not no potent. And so by a quick argument that generalizes, we could show that the upper triangle matrices are not nilpotent in general. Um, and so th this contrasts the fact that they are actually solvable, but they're not nilpotent. So it doesn't go the other way. If you're solvable, it doesn't mean you're nilpotent, but if you're nilpotent, it means you're solvable. So similarly, it, we didn't have to pick E12 here. We could have picked Eij as long as I less than J. That's all that matters. So now, we, we have this for the uh, upper triangle matrices. Let's take a look at the strictly upper triangle matrices. So let me change the pen color here. Maybe green would be nice. So we have the strictly upper triangle matrices. Um, let's see, n comma f. So we'll set, we'll use four comma c again. And so this guy is spanned by e one two, e one three, e one four, e two three. E24 and E34, right? We don't have the diagonal terms anymore. And so playing around, oh, excuse me, playing around a little bit would be uh, playing around with these base vectors, which show that uh, the, the pattern is as follows. When you do, if you call this K, and generally I use K to denote the subalgebras of L, in this case, L was, were the upper triangle matrices. Then, what if you if we call this guy here in the span of these guys would be k to the zero, then k to the one would be spanned by everything on level one and higher. So recall the notion of level we introduced last time, which was that uh, these guys are level one, these guys are level two, and level three, and so on. So e i j has level j minus i. So K1, turns out, is actually spanned by the vectors, let's see if I can get the similar colors last time, okay, E13, uh, E14, and E24. So level 2 and higher, and then K2 is spanned by level 3 and higher, and K3 is spanned by level uh, 4 and higher, and so on. And we can show this pretty easily just by some uh, an, an inductive argument, probably. Um, and so what, what we're noticing is that, here, let's draw a nice K, is that each time we bracket with K, which is our first, which is the Lie algebra that we're considering, we see that we are losing a level. And so because we only have a finite number of levels in the uh, strictly upper triangle matrices, and we don't experience this problem here with uh, EII, because there are no EII in, like there are in the upper triangle matrices, we see that the uh, strictly upper triangle matrices have to be nilpotent because this lower central series will terminate. So this is an example of a nilpotent uh, Lie algebra. And so in particular, we can show that um, n to the n comma f is nilpotent the lower central series terminates when, uh, so we call this k, k to the n plus, or just k to the n. So uh, let's see, terminates at k to the n. So that is the uh, an example. Now let's move on to some interesting facts, I guess, that Humphreys introduces here. So we have the following proposition. Let L be a Lie algebra. Then we have the following facts. L nilpotent implies all subalgebras of L and all homomorphic images are nilpotent. And so 
I'm going to leave this to the viewer. It the proof of this follows identically, almost identically to how we showed it in the previous video with solvability. Um, so I don't think it's worthwhile to pursue this. However, it's it's an important fact to know. So moving on, we have the next fact. If L mod its center is an L potent, L is an L potent. So this is pretty, uh, it's not trivial, but it's pretty easy to see. So we're saying that L mod its center as a quotient algebra is no potent. So I'll use Z to denote the center for simplicity. And so L mod Z to the N equals zero for some N. So in, in this case, it's a quotient algebra. So, so really I should say zero plus the center. So we know that the homomorphism, the canonical map pi of L to the N is actually equal to L mod Z to the N because we saw that homomorphisms can kind of swap out, like pi of L to the N is equal to pi of L to the N. So with that in mind, if this guy is equal to this, then this has to be equal to z, z, uh, zero plus Z by the transitive property. So pi of L to the N equals zero plus Z. So all of these vectors in L to the N get mapped to zero. So L to the N is contained in the kernel of pi. But the kernel of pi is simply everything in the ideal that we quotiented out, in this case, the center. So this is the center. So L to the N is contained in the center. So now consider the term L to the N plus one is equal to L bracket L to the N, which is contained in L bracket the center. But the center is commutes with everything, so this is actually this equal to zero. So we found an n, in this case n plus one. Uh, maybe I shouldn't use n twice there. So we, we found an m such that this uh, lower central series terminates, and so we conclude that L is nil potent. So now the last statement, very trivial, is um, L nil potent. L no potent implies that its center is non-trivial, provided L not equal to zero. That's just like an edge case. And so this is pretty easy to see. Suppose N is the smallest N such that L to the N equals zero, which we know exists because L is no potent. So then consider L to the N minus one bracket with L. This is equal to L to the N which is equal to zero. So everything in L to the N minus one commutes with everything in L. So we know that L to the N minus one is non-zero because we said N was the smallest such N satisfying this property. So L to the N minus one not equal to zero is contained in um, the center. So we have a non-trivial center. So that fact follows pretty nicely. So, there is, I guess, one last thing I'd like to mention, which is the condition on um, no potency is equivalent to saying kind of the following, right? So we're saying that L to the N, like this, we're bracketing L N times. So there's kind of like N L's that we bracket with. If we bracket enough times, we will always end up with zero. This is what no potency is. No potent. So my point is that if you give me any sequence of n vectors, so let's say they're x1 dot 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 down to xn, if you give me any sequence of n vectors, if I just bracket with them on any arbitrary vector in this order, so let's say our arbitrary vector is y, I'm always gonna get zero. So in particular, there's nothing stopping me from just picking the same x, right? So I could say, take xn equals x and just bracket with x over and over and over again. And so what we have here is that if you look at this closely, really this is add x to the n. 
acting on Y, right? Because we do one addix here and then one addix here and addix on that and addix on that, so on and so on. And so what we're saying is that addix to the N acting on any Y is equal to zero. So what we see is that because Y was arbitrary, add X to the N is a zero matrix. And so add X from linear algebra is nilpotent. It's a nilpotent endomorphism. And in particular, this guy is, is a matrix, right? He's an element of GL of L. That's what makes it nice to look at because even if we're dealing with an abstract algebra, add X is nilpotent. And so we say X element of L is add nilpotent if, well, add X is nilpotent. And so what we see here is that if L is nilpotent, every element of L is add nilpotent. And I hope that's pretty obvious from, from right from the definition of no potency. If you give me any any vector in L, I just apply the adjoint n times, and I have to get zero. If I don't get zero, then it's it, the lower central series doesn't terminate at n. And so, if you're telling me it's no potent, I can always find such an n so that it has to terminate. So that's a pretty interesting statement um, of no potency. This is if L is no potent, every element of L is add no potent. Now, the, the interesting question is, what about the converse? What if you told me that every element of L is ad nilpotent? Could I say that L is nilpotent? And so Engel's theorem, which we will look at in the next video, um, or at least one formulation of Engel's, Engel's theorem, we will see that if all elements of L are ad nilpotent, then L is nilpotent. So that will conclude this video. Um, and I guess we'll, I'll see you in the next video and talk about Engel's theorem. So thank you for watching.